Today, this afternoon, we are discussing a topic that keeps political analysts busy around the globe, populism and how to respond to it. Is populism a bad habit? Is it a sign that political culture is in danger? Is it a wake-up call for Democrats? These are some of the questions that we will discuss in the next 90 minutes. My name is Christian Spahr. I'm in charge of the media program Southeast Europe, not Southeast Asia, uh, of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We have three media programs um, around the world, uh, one in um, Asia, based in Singapore, one in um, South Africa, and one in uh, Southeast Europe. And this media program is an initiative for quality journalism and modern political communication. Um, in uh, Southeast Europe, we are covering 10 countries, for instance, Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia. And as Torben Stefan is doing here in uh, Singapore, we engage in public debate about uh, media diversity, about the journalism of the future, provide training for reporters, but also foster an understanding of political communications where citizens are dialogue partners, not just recipients. Um, all these CAS three media programs are involved here in this conference, and this gives us an opportunity to compare different perspectives and experiences from different um, continents. Here in this panel this afternoon, we gathered experts uh, from Australia, Germany, and Malaysia, and we will discuss if there is only bad populism or if there is also good populism. Uh, whether it is better to ignore them, uh, the populists, or to discuss on their topics. And uh, we will also um, discuss about possible consequences of the rise of populism uh, for the field of political communications and for the media. Uh, populists like to claim that the needs of ordinary, ordinary citizens have been ignored too long. And one main challenge definitely for our debate is uh, certainly to outline effective ways how to reconnect with supporters of populist movements and how to build trust. Our first speaker will be Nicole Curato. Please come on the stage. Nicole, um, Nicole Curato is a research fellow at the University of Canberra. She received a high level award for her work on democratic politics of post-disaster contexts. And she is an expert on democratic theory and practice, especially on the case of the Philippines and President Duterte. Um, Nicole is also a frequent contributor in media like CNN, The New York Times, and Rapplercom. And she joined us despite a small accident she had at the weekend. Uh, you can see it a little bit. Uh, one of the arms, and um, I think this deserves even a bigger applause uh, for Nicole Curato. <laughs> Our second keynote speaker will be Professor Werner Patzelt from uh, Dresden University of Technology. Please come on the stage. Uh, Professor Patzelt is um, in charge of the topics of political systems and system comparison at his university. Uh, also, he has visiting professorships in Austria, France, Turkey, and South Africa. She, he's a well-known political commentator in German and international media. And for instance, he's analyzing the German right-wing populist party, AFD. Welcome at our discussion. <laughs> I'm glad to welcome our next speaker from Malaysia, Wan Saiful Wan Jan. Please come on the stage. He is the chief executive of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, a not-for-profit organization that he co-founded in 2010. He has leading functions in different other institutes and NGOs and is actively involved in community activities and charity. He is also a regular commentator on Malaysian and regional affairs in international media, promoting values of a free society. Welcome. And last but not least, a further expert from Germany, Professor Ute Frevert, director at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Please join us. Uh, her research interests include the, th the history of emotions and political history. And for instance, she published well-known books on the history of women in Germany and also on European identifications. Uh, she will shed a light on our topic from social and cultural points of view and uh, 
warm welcome to you as well. Now it is my pleasure to take a seat myself and to listen to the first presentation by Nicole. All right, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for um, being here and we'll make this very exciting because after lunch is always a very tricky time um, to speak. So I very much welcome the challenge of thinking about how we can deal um, with populism. And I have two reasons for my enthusiasm. Um, first, my work for the past 10 years has been about how we can make political communication more democratic. Um, I work at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Glo Global Governance at the University of Canberra. And the kind of research that we do um, tries to make sense of politics in a way that considers talking more than voting as central to political life. So our main thrust actually is to assess how democracies conduct political conversations. We examine the extent to which parliamentary debates, media coverage, international negotiations, particularly climate change negotiations, um, uphold the standards of inclusiveness and reason giving. We also conduct um, what we call democratic experiments, or carefully designed forums where citizens can engage in deliberations and make policy proposals to government and other stakeholders. Our hope is to think of ways to make democratic politics more sensitive to the reasons put forward by the public. So it's very interesting for us, as scholars who study democratic communication, to witness the rise of Donald Trump, Nigel Farage, Marine Le Pen, and of course, Rodrigo Duterte. Tomorrow, in the plenary session, I will discuss what precisely accounts for um, President Duterte's rise in the Philippines. But for now, um, the task given to me is to discuss what we can do about it. This leads me to the second reason why I'm very enthusiastic about this topic. Last year, I was in the Philippines conducting fieldwork at the height of the presidential campaign. I witnessed how Rodrigo Duterte electrified the voters throughout the country, whether it is here in Manila, or in the picture in Manila, where he gathered the largest of crowds, or in conflict zones in southern Philippines, where these young conserv conservative female students explained to me why they would still vote for a man who made jokes about wanting to rape a dead Australian missionary. It was also at that time when I felt most unsafe in my home country. At the time, I was writing pieces for mainstream media that have been very critical of the candidate um, Duterte. And the responses to these pieces are just the most fascinating um, for a sociologist, but also the most troubling for the ordinary person. Um, if you were here in the first session, Maria Ressa talked about the threats that she received as part of her job as a journalist. I also kind of gotten the same responses, but not to the same extent. Um, I've been, I too have been receiving rape threats, been called, pardon the language, a cunt, a bitch, and a whore. You can just sense the sexist language at work here. And felt harassed by a flurry of messages on social media, discrediting me and my work. So it's hard not to feel um, shaken with what's going on, because once you critique a populist leader, then for some reason there is some level of backlash um, against particularly um, female um, individuals who try to contribute to public conversation. There is a term in the Philippines used to describe the people who defend President Duterte no matter what. They are pejoratively labeled Dutertards or Duterte's retards, which is a term I do not like at all. Why? This brings me to the two short points I wish to raise on how to deal with populism. First, I argue that we cannot deal with populism by using the same corrosive rhetoric that populism uses. I suppose now is the time for me to exactly say what I mean by populism. Well, two things. One, populism is a political logic, to borrow Ernesto Laclau's term. It is a logic that divides the virtuous people, and I'm doing air quotes here, versus the dangerous other, also in air quotes. So inherent in the logic of populism is the logic of exclusion. Populism is a process of creating a collective identity by saying who we are in opposition to who we are not. Secondly, populism is also a political style, to borrow the term my colleague Ben Moffitt uses. It is a political style that uses the language of crisis to raise fears. Populism also engages in the coarsening of political discourse, the tabloidization of politics, as other scholars put it. 
Some would argue that while populism has always been a feature of politics, it is just a matter of degree or the extent to which uh, politicians use the populist style. But what's distinct in our time is that populism is performed in a digital age where the demands of the visual and our vocabulary changes. Populism, as some would argue, is, the inevitable, is inevitable in the age of clickbait. So allow me now to return to the, voice, the, the first point about dealing with populism. We cannot deal with populist rhetoric with populist rhetoric. To call Duterte supporters as Dutertards, to call Donald Trump supporters as deplorables, only serve to reinforce the divisions that populists have manufactured. This, of course, is not to say that it's not important to stop calling out ideas that we find offensive. I'm not certain about the political leanings of the people in this room, but for me, I think it's important to call out bigotry against same-sex couples. I think it's important to call out falsehoods perpetuated against immigration. I think we should speak up against President Duterte's bloody war on drugs because it is a bloody war against the poor. So yes, I think it's important to push back. But pushing back is not enough. I agree with Naomi Klein when she says no is not enough. We need to provide alternatives and provide alternatives and articulate these alternatives well. But more than this, however, I think that saying no must always be complemented by asking why. When I observe arguments that unfold in social media, I realize that these arguments begin with a failure to ask why. For example, there is a thread um, in a colleague's Facebook wall talking about how good it is that the Duterte regime is planning to heavily invest in infrastructure spending. A number of her friends, critical of Duterte, started commenting on her post, saying whether these infrastructure projects are, dis are just distractions, breads and circuses, so to speak, against the war against drugs. Someone labeled her a Dutertard, saying it's unfortunate that she too belongs to the deluded mass of Duterte supporters, excusing the bloody war on drugs for infrastructure spending. The thread, in other words, has gone bonkers, um, to use a technical term Australians use. So, I think the conversation could have gone a different way. If we ask questions instead of rendered immediate judgments, asking what do you mean could have opened a more fruitful discussion for that person to explain the nuances of her position. How does this relate to your view on the drug war could have instigated a discussion that weighs different ethical positions. Of course, I can't blame my colleagues' friends for jumping into immediate judgment. This is exactly what the populist mood makes us do. I, too, have picked a lot of fights with some friends when they say something positive about Donald Trump, for example. But we have to start training ourselves in terms of asking why instead of rendering immediate judgments. I think populist rhetoric, the corrosive kind, becomes successful because it shapes how we think when we end up thinking in binaries instead of when we end up thinking in terms of pros versus cons, when nuance goes out of the window. I think that's when populism begins to thrive. This leads me to my final point. To deal with populism, we need to be better at listening. Populists are fantastic politicians because they know the people's pulse. They know this because they listen, not only to what, be, what is being articulated, but more importantly, they listen to what is not being said. It is not an accident that racist views in the United States are ideas that, once again, can be said in public with the rise of Trump. Trump knew what I argue or what I call latent anxieties, or things that cannot be said, but nevertheless important to people. I realized this when I was going over two years' worth of transcripts that I gathered as part of my fieldwork in the Philippines. Um, earlier, I mentioned that my research in the past two years has focused on disaster-affected communities in central Philippines. These are the communities that were worst hit by Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. When I read the transcripts I've gathered um, over the past two years, last year, when President Duterte won the presidency, I realized that my respondents have been talking about the problem of illegal drugs all along. So I remember one mother, for example, when I was asking her, what to you is the most immediate issue in this new relocation site where you moved? She told me, I'm afraid my son might get into trouble. When I probed, what do you mean get in trouble? I'm afraid he might start dealing crystal meth. As someone who's not so immersed with what's going on in their everyday lives, I thought, oh, all right, yeah, whatever, it's just another issue. I'm worried about your disaster context. But when I look back at these transcripts, I realize that they have been saying this all along, except that these anxieties are latent. 
They remain in the background. And populists are particularly good at politicizing what latent anxieties have been present for these people. So the issue to me was invisible, the issue of illegal drugs. Perhaps just like other politicians who knew it was a problem, tried to create policies to solve it, but did not politicize it. And President Duterte did just that. And I imagine that is also applicable to other contexts, whether we talk about Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, about people's latent injuries they experience from, um, from the richer part of society, whether it is um, the, the movement, the, the white supremacist movement in the United States, where people felt that there are ideas they can't say anymore, but Donald Trump allowed them to say these ideas already. Populists are able to give voice to the unspeakable. And so this has become the most important lesson, lesson for me. When dealing with populism, we need to be sensitive to others' latent anxieties. We, did, we need to do this because before we can effectively condemn, we first have to listen. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Nicole. Um, I think you said something very important. It is not possible to counter populism with populist rhetorics to use the same uh, methods. Well, let me ask you um, another question. Do you think that most of the supporters of populist movements are rather naive? Or do you think that most of them can be one for a fruitful debate? Right. Um, tomorrow... Hello? Okay, tomorrow in actually the, the plenary session, I will give you some vignettes of um, Duterte supporters that I have interviewed, but probably just to give a flavor of what they actually think. I find that their support to the populist leader is conditional, not fanatical. It is negotiated, it is not manipulated. What's interesting about at least the, uh, the Philippine case is that there is room for pluralism in populism. So it's very, I think it's incorrect for us to lump them all together in one basket of deplorables. I think that is very misleading because if we try to unpack the rationalities of people who are supportive of some populist leaders, then I think there is room for engagement, there is room for debate, especially if we engage them offline. The story online, of course, is a different story. Many thanks. Uh, you mentioned the heated debate on the social media, but uh, also you point out that uh, it doesn't bring us further to look upon them. Uh, we need to engage in dialogue with uh, supporters of populist movements. I guess this is also a little bit the uh, theory of uh, Professor uh, Patzelt. I know some of your interviews in uh, German media, and you once said, populism is the ugly brother of democracy. Um, the origin of the world, word populism, populus, is basically the same as the word democracy, which comes from the Greek word demos. And uh, so we are talking about two sides of one coin. And maybe let's go a little bit deeper in the, in the theory first. What are general characteristics of uh, populism? And um, in your opinion, what is the best response? Feel free to speak to us. Well, there can't be any doubt that populism today is a widespread phenomenon all around the world, from South America over Northern America, Europe to the Philippines. And if you have such a widespread phenomenon, of course, you need not a narrow notion, a narrow concept of populism if you want to really understand what is it about and what can be done with populism if you do not want simply to accept it. So, a complex notion, a complex concept of populism is required. There are two cheap exits from this challenge. The first one is, well, populism is divided between populism bottom-up and top-down. There are populist top politicians, and there are populist leaders of political movements who want to arrive at power. Well, this is only description. There is no added analytical value to this distinction between populism from above and populism bottom up. And the other cheap exit from the challenge to form a complex notion of populism is to make the, dis the distinction between good and bad populism. What would be the criteria for distinguishing good and bad populism? It's subject subjective normative value judgment. After all, as you put it before, populism and democracy 
are from the same family, therefore there is no clear dividing line between true populists and true democrats. There is only uh, a mixture of gray between white and black, and uh, we have to accept that there are criteria on, on which some clear democrats are similar to some clear populists, and this is what I'm dealing right now. I will show you uh, five uh, elements of populism which I found helpful to describe, to analyze this phenomenon when looking at the different phenomena of populism throughout the world and when looking at the literature. And with reference to each of these five elements, it can be clearly shown what the duty, really the duty of journalists and media would be in dealing with populism. First element of populism is Simplification. Simplification not for pedagogical reasons or for didactic reasons, but simplification for demagogical reasons. See, simplification is a part of democratic political discourse, in particular during electoral campaigns. So this is not the basic distinction, but the basic issue is whether you use simplification for demagogical reasons or if you use it simply to be understandable, to explain something which is difficult itself to an audience which is not prepared to accept or to understand complex uh, arguments. So the duty, of matter, uh, the duty of media and journalists is never to mirror such simplification or simply to criticize such si simplification but the job of media, of journalists, is to give understandable, non-simplistic information about those complex political issues on which populists draw their benefits by simplification for getting a broader audience, for getting supporters. Let's come to the second element of populism. I like to call it selfish political entrepreneurship. See, we have the figure of the entrepreneur, somebody who wants to achieve something in economy, in culture, wherever, and in politics as well. Most democratic politicians are political entrepreneurs, usually with progressive ambition. And there is nothing wrong about that. If you want to exert political influence, you need a political, you need public office. You have to run for public office. You create your constituency. You are an entrepreneur. So this is not the difference between true democratic politicians and populist leaders, but there is a difference. Populist leaders do so less in the service of the common good, but mainly for selfish reasons. If you look at the present American president, you really can come into doubt whether he wanted to become president to serve his country or to have a new objective for his personal ambition. So selfishness in being a political entrepreneur is the important issue, which makes clear whether somebody is a populist leader or not. Here the duty of media and journalists is never to bow to a political leader's charisma, never to act as an admirer or as a supporter of even a charismatic leader but to remain in the position of a critical observer, a critical observer of what, of what such political leaders do or avoid to do, claim or avoid claiming. Critical distance, not mirroring, not giving additional public communicative support. Now let's come to the third element of populism. The third element is the inclination and the practice of opposing we the people, and they, this non-responsive, even corrupt political elite. Wherever you find a populist movement, you see exactly this opposition. We the people, and they the traitors of the people, those who are selfish and not willing to serve the public good. Again, on the one hand, Opposing representatives and those who are represented is quite in order, is quite necessary within representative democracy. See, in political science, we have the language of agency theory. We have principles and we have agents. In a representative democracy, the people is the agent, 
the people is the principle, and the elected politicians are the agents of the people as the principle. There is a distinction. We expect politicians to do the job serving us, and there is a distinction, unless you indulge in the illusions of direct democracy where everybody who is governed is governing himself at the same time, which is quite fashionable or has been quite fashionable in the history of political theory, but has nothing to do with how political systems can be constructed. But in this principal-agent relationship, it can be the case, and very often it is the case, that the representatives become irresponsive, detached from the people they are supposed to work for, that they become even arrogant, that they have the feeling, well, we know everything much better than these people. They come across our way in what we want to do. They want to mix in some particular interest which we consider as being wrong and mistaken, therefore we better do not discuss with them. So in this case, really a split between we the people and they, the irres irresponsive political leaders, occurs. And then we have empty space for populists because populists and populist leaders argue exactly along the line in order to win supporters, to build a counter position to the established political class. And doing so, they usually underestimate the value of institutional arrangements institutional arrangements which make this relationship between principals and agents responsive ones and which really allow concretizing representative democracy. The duty of the media here is to make clear the value of representative democracy. To make clear, not by technical terms, but in everyday words, make clear what a chain of delegation means how such a chain of delegation between principles, the people and agents, the politicians, has to be formed, has to be maintained, such there is really a responsive relationship which is at the core of representative democracy. Media and journalists have to criticize established parties, established politicians, if they become irresponsive or arrogant. And they have to criticize populist leaders if they argue in favor of personal leader-follower relationships instead of such complex institutional settings which we call representative democracy. The fourth element of populism is the claim that there is something like a clear and unanimous will of the people. Because this is typical for populists saying, well, we the people know because we are suffering from the consequences of these established uh, policies. We know what is the case, what our desires are, and since we are in a democracy, those politicians should transform our political will into political practice, and if they are not willing to do so or not able to do so, well, then we have a problem with democracy. This will of the people claimed to exist, this clear unanimous will of the people claimed to exist, this will is given voice by populist leaders, by our leaders of we the people, and therefore our leaders unquestionably enjoy democratic legitimacy, be they elected or not. They give expression to the will of the people, those elected politicians for a long while got detached from the rest of the population, therefore they are no longer democratically legitimated. Election does not matter giving expression to the true will of the people. That's the core issue. Well, the duty of the media and of journalists is making clear that the guiding ideas of pluralist democracy are far away from any claim that so something like a true will of the people might exist. There is a large diversity of individual and collective desires, hopes, preferences, which have to be mirrored in the political process. But there is nothing like the will of the people. So this plurality of different interests needs to be shown, needs to be explained as legitimate, while the claim 
that there be one unanimous will of the people, which should be the guiding line for elected politicians, must be shown to be absolutely wrong and misleading, leading into authoritarian dictatorship. This fifth element of populism needs a more theoretical approach. Let us start the argument by a short model of a perfect representative democracy. It would look like as follows. There is a distribution of political preferences, political opinions, desires in the population, say, between the left and the right. Of course, this distribution is a dynamic one. It's changing, depending on whatever circumstances. But at any given moment, there is a certain distribution, be it known or unknown. The political class, political parties, members of parliament, leading politicians in a representative democracy are supposed to mirror, to give expression to this plurality, to this large variety of political convictions and preferences in the society. Of course, this process of representation is a dynamic one. There are learning effects on both sides. There are new things that happen that change the distribution of desires and preferences. And therefore, there is always a need for readaptation of the preferences as expressed by representatives and what the people indeed think about different political topics. Our usual mean to make sure this readjustment is periodic elections, because ahead of elections, political parties have to take into consideration what their possible voters really think. And this is what constitutes democracy in final analysis. But for whatever reason it might occur, that the political class no longer is willing to represent the full range of political desires, wishes, preferences in the population. There may be good reasons for that. If you, have, if you have extremist views, persons who want to get rid of representative democracy, or simply political idiots, there is no need to represent them. There is need to educate them by taking serious what they are thinking about, by explaining policy, by addressing their topics but in a better way that they would be able to address their own topics, their own interests, their, their own subjects. For whatever reason, political parties may be inclined to neglect some parts of public political opinion or of private political opinion, which no longer is transposed into public political opinion. For instance, in a society like the German one, Concerns of some parts of the population about immigration were not considered as serious. And when they were brought up, a significant part of the political class decided those are non-topics. Let's not talk about them. If we would talk about immigration issues, we would only stir right-wing radical movements. So let's talk about it. Let's not talk about it. And so there came into existence what I found useful to call a gap of representation. If gaps of representation occur, then empty space is created in which populist movements can take their existence, can, can settle down, can blossom, can develop. So the fact that we have populist movements or that we have a populist movement in a country seems to me to be a valid indicator of some problems in the functioning of representative democracy in such a country. Therefore, populist movements need to be taken serious because they are indicators of things that are not going well. Depending on whether more the left part or the right part of private political opinions of a people are neglected by the political class. You see the emergence of left-wing populism, of right-wing populism, of Islamic populism, Christian populism, atheist populism, whatever kind of reaction to the established political discourse. So in this situation, what, what would be the duty of media 
to deal with populism, the duty of journalists. Well, first duty, journalists and media should observe closely whether and where such gaps of representation come into being and for what reasons. It was really a shortcoming of our German media system, not detecting, not giving expression early enough the to the fact that there is growing disconcern with a growing part of the German population with immigration and following lack of integration of immigrants into German society. So detecting gaps of representation. And then second duty, duty urging the established politicians, political parties, members of parliament, to close such emerging gaps in due time. And you can close gaps of representation in two ways. Either by explaining policy, which is considered to be necessary, then you are working on the convictions of people, on their mindsets. Or if you do not find sound and convincing explanations for the policy you are following, maybe if this policy is wrong, then you need some readjustments of public policy in order to reintegrate those parts of the population who got the feeling that the political class has become detached from them. Never media and journalists should accept or even support any taboos by which feeling, by the feeling of which such gaps could be closed and where the imperatives of political correctness prevent such gaps of representation to be closed. Because cultivating imperatives and taboos of political correctness quite often seems as a tool for political leaders, for established politicians, not to engage in doing policies which run counter to their traditions, convictions, things that took for granted so far. So the imperatives of political correctness very often are instruments for hindering learning on one's own part, on the part of the population, and media would do a bad job if they would accept such reluctance for political learning. They should much rather bring forward, exert pressure towards political learning. So media and journalists should urge politicians to improve the empirically observable wishes of the population, which might deviate from the wishes expressed and followed by the political leaders. They should, these should be improved to wishes, to desires, to preferences the people, the population would have if they could collect and process relevant information as carefully as politicians can do or are assumed to do so. So media should be part of a game which prevents the emergence of gaps of representation and which exerts pressure towards closing them because this is the best way to fight counter populism. Let me end with summing up what seem to be the most important strategies against populism. First of all, avoid the emergence or the enduring existence of gaps of representation, which means for media, I put it before, urge for adaptation of policy to reality, even if this readaptation of policy to reality should require unwelcome reconsiderations of established convictions and practices. Second strategy, improve the empirically observable will of the population. This means on part of media and journalists, do not exclude topics as politically incorrect, but discuss why they emerge, under what circumstances they emerge, try to distinguish what is sound in terms of popular concerns with policy making and what is unsound. Distinguish what is rational from what is irrational. Distinguish from what has substance from what is only a form of phobia. And third strategy, engage in what I like to call close distance combat with populists. Engage in close distance combat with populists. I do not talk of dialogue. I talk of combat. You have to win fights against 
radicals, extremists, or simply stupid politicians. And you have to engage in these fights. And you have to engage in fights in front of a big audience. And you have to try to win there. And because the game of populism is based on simplification, you really have to be able to come up with rhetorical skills and with substantive knowledge. And my feeling is that the usual warning against public discussions with populists has much to do with some concerns, with some worrying of established politicians not being able to cope with populists in their own language. And they do not want to suffer some defeats or suffer being wounded by the foes. But nevertheless, if we want to preserve representative democracy, we have to engage time and again in such close distance combat. The alternative strategy recommended so often consists in keeping silent about populist topics, excluding populist politicians from round tables, from public discussions, hoping that they will disappear because nobody wants to play with them. So they go home and say, oh, maybe I was wrong because nobody wants to share my thoughts. Oh, no. Never an adversary, a foe, an enemy, has been defeated by talking with friends in a critical way about this foe, an enemy. Only if you engage in fights with them, you will win. And since journalists and media are an integrated and necessary part of representative democracy, they should never be only observers to what politicians do or avoid doing, they should be part of this fight, but not simply with criticizing populists, but with engaging in close distance combat. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Professor Werner Patzelt. Uh, I call this a wake-up call, what you just said. Uh, engage in uh, combat with uh, populists. Um, thank you for outlining the characteristics of um, populism, also commenting on the responsibility of media. We will get back to that uh, a little bit later. Let me ask you one uh, more short question. Um, between the lines, I understood that uh, basically democratic uh, parties, established parties, were too lazy uh, to um, engage in a true discussion in a combat with populists. Is your impression that parties in Germany, for instance, and in other countries have realized the challenge? Well, according to my observations, parties have realized this challenge, but it's like in real life. When it comes to dating, sometimes it can be too late. An opportunity may have been missed. And my feeling is that the established parties, in particular in Germany, missed the opportunity to fight the emerging right-wing populism when still the time has been. Now the right-wing populism in Germany found its political party, the AfD, which will, without any doubt, enter the next Bundestag, with, which will change the, the rules, not the rules of the political game, but the tactical and strategic considerations, which squeezes the Christian Democrats move to the center and even to the left of the center, which uh, makes quite narrow the political space open for the social Democrats with disastrous consequences for our political system and our possibilities to form sound political coalitions. Yes, we have recognized the danger, but we did not recognize it uh, and we did not draw the necessary consequences when time has been to do so. That sounds quite pessimistic. Well, see, the pessimist would say in the long run all of us are dead. The optimist would say, well, we have problems. All biographies are full of problems, so are the biographies of political systems. We are ahead of problems, but looking 40 years back, in 40 years from now, we will see that we have managed to overcome the problems because the important thing is to rely on the sound principles of representative democracy, not indulging into demagogical oversimplification, 
criticizing having control of political entrepreneurs, making clear what the guiding ideas of representative democracy are, and engaging in close distance combats with all those who would say, well, democracy is not a solution to problems. It is a problem or the cause of problems because these politicians do not do the policies preferred by the population. If we rely on that and we, if we act accordingly, we will overcome all these difficulties without any doubt. Many thanks for this food for thought. Um, now we switch again to um, Asia to hear a perspective and um, uh, examples from um, Malaysia, one Saiful, one Jan. In the USA, um, many criticize uh, Trump's rhetoric with regard to different ethnicities and uh, people fear tension in the society. Malaysia is even a more multi-ethnic and multi-religious -religi country than the USA. Um, do you um, see an effect of populism uh, on societies uh, like yours in the sense that you that balance in the society is in danger, balance between ethnic and religious groups? And um, so what is the Malaysian example? I'll speak from here, yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let, let me just... Uh, for a brief introduction, uh, as, a, as you mentioned just now, my name is Wan Saiful Wan Jan. I run an organization in Malaysia called Ideas Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. One of the problems that we face in a country like Malaysia is that issue of multi-ethnicity. And it's not just about the, the ethnicity of the population, it's also about the religions of the population. And uh, us being a multi-religious, multi-ethnic country, the political parties are arranged along uh, ethnic lines and religious lines as well. And this creates a real uh, problem when we deal with hard policy issues. Because politicians tend to go out there and, and measure, maybe you know, using polls, uh, results, and so on. I know we have sessions on polls uh, at this conference. And they would determine, they would measure, they would gauge what is it that the public wants from them. And then they would give the public that, and then that's how they win. So listening to the two speakers just now, I'm not sure whether we, we are describing the problem of populism or we're describing the problem of politics generally. Because the job of a politician is to be popular. You know, if you, you go out there claiming that I don't want to be popular, I know what you want, I'm not giving you any of that you will never be a successful politician. If you go out there saying that society is heading this way and I'm going to change you all, I'm going to change you to this direction, you're unlikely going to win. And, and this is a challenge that we face in a country like Malaysia where citizens are very worried, especially uh, if we just simplify the picture. We have our society divided into three big categories uh, called the Malays, the ethnic Malays, who are, major, who are Muslims. Then we have the Chinese, who is a mix between Christians and, and Buddhists. And we have uh, uh, the, the Indians, mainly from the south of India, historically speaking, uh, but, but Hindus or Christians. Now, uh, between the th three ethnic populations, I'm simplifying greatly here because we have more than 100 ethnic groups in the country, but these are the three major ones. Between these three groups, the demands are, um, are very different from one another. And among the Malay Muslim population, the fear is that uh, they might lose the political control that they have now. And as a result of that, they would support uh, propositions from politicians that will defend and champion their so-called ethnic rights. And this is not very much different from what we see in the West. Uh, you know, Trump, for example, appealed to the, the, the Rust Belt, uh, basically the whites uh, of, of uh, the, the US. And we see the rising uh, right-wing uh, populism in many uh, European countries as well. So I guess in a country like Malaysia, the politicians go out there firstly to gauge what is it that the, the voters want. And the problem is they give the voters exactly what they want. I don't know whether we can solve that problem because all politicians will try to do exactly that. Now, I think in order to change that trajectory, the role is not really for the politicians because politicians, to me, are not really leaders. Politicians are followers of what the public, uh, what they feel the public want. So if we take that, that position, immediately the role of 
uh, the, the role of uh, uh, the media is very important, as you rightly pointed out. The role of civil society is very important as well. And putting all hope to the media, I think, is a very problematic situation. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it has a lot of challenges. Because we expect the media to understand all these things. Just imagine if, if there are members of the media here, I write uh, in newspapers, I have a weekly column in, in different newspapers. And you know, if I were to summarize what the two keynote speakers just now uh, have said, you know, I would really struggle to be accurate and to be exact in my reporting of what they said. Because I'm not uh, an expert the way they are in the topics that they spoke on. And that is the problem that we face. Many of our journalists, many members of the media that we have today, are generalists, generalist journalists. They are not specialist journalists. With the pressure that's coming from social media to downsize, to uh, you know, make the organization more lean and so on, it puts a lot more pressure on the media to, to have more generalist reporters rather than specialist reporters. And unfortunately, this makes it really difficult for us to expect members of the media to be able, and I'm talking about Malaysia, maybe even Singapore, maybe even Indonesia, um, and, and, and the countries around, around this region, you know, to put all our expectation on the media is a very tall order for them to fulfill. And I think this is where civil society needs to come in. In the context of Malaysia, in the context of Indonesia, uh, I think civil society are coming in. You know, organizations like CAS, for example, are playing an important role as well in supporting the local uh, uh, civil society organizations that we have. And the civil society needs to play a longer term role. In the context of Malaysia, for example, if we play the short term game, wanting to win in the next election and make sure populist ideas uh, do not win in the next election, the next general election is probably going to happen next year. Then, then we are going to be in very deep trouble because our horizon is very short term. We are the, the non-populist, the more principled actors in this game, unfortunately are latecomers to the game. You know, we are responding to the rise of populism. We fail to shape the discourse. We fail to popularize our own ideas. And until today, the complaint that we have is our ideas are too complex uh, to be popularized. We need to get over this, we need to be able to somehow put an argument in 140 characters. I don't know how to do that on Twitter. I don't know how to argue for you know, more liberalized economic principles. Uh, for example, in 140 characters, we will really struggle to do that, but we need to get over that problem and somehow deal with it. In Malaysia, if I can conclude by saying, in the context of Malaysia, I think we are not succeeding in doing that yet. The rise of ethno-nationalist populist ideas is really worrying, it's dividing society, but that is exactly how the political parties stay in power. In a country like Singapore, interestingly enough, uh, I think you know, no political party need to be populist because there's no danger. So while populism is not necessarily a problem here, it's not because you know, the political environment is a healthy one, there's just no real debate happening. In a, a more complex society like Indonesia, it's even more problematic, it's a huge population. There's a, a rise in Islamist conservatism coming out and coupled with the rise of inequality in society. How in the world do we address that problem through Twitter and Facebook posts? I, I have no idea how to do that, but we certainly need to, to tackle it somehow. So let me stop there and hopefully we can get into more conversation later on. Well, many thanks for this uh, good example. And uh, you mentioned the media. Mm, definitely, it's true basically all over the world that media have stronger economic constraints nowadays. Less journalists produce more news for more channels. So definitely, uh, the depth in the news, in the reporting, is uh, being lost um, uh, quite often. Um, whom do you see most um, in, in the best position to uh, explain complex policies in simple words. Is it the politicians themselves? Is it um, civil society representatives? Is it the media? Um, who does it best and who is the most responsible in, in doing so? Well, the, the short answer to your question is definitely not the politicians. Uh, but, you know, but I, I have not very high hope of politicians steering the discourse. 
Because I think if they try to steer the discourse, or if we expect them to steer the discussion, then we will end up in a situation where they, they might not win. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the reality is for politicians, they can throw in maybe 20, 30% of principal ideas, but the, the other, the 70, 80% has to be about being popular. It's a shame, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that I have to say that, but we work with several political parties in, in Malaysia uh, and observing what's happening around the world as well. I think if politicians try to be principal all the time, they will not get very far. This is why I think the role of civil society, the role of academics uh, is very important. Civil society needs to be able to translate what the academics are saying, because academics, you know, the general language is language by itself. Academic journals, you know, this, this is a completely alien language to the vast majority of the population. So uh, somehow people in civil society, the opinion uh, article uh, authors and so on, need to be tr able to translate those complex arguments in academia into something that the public will understand. I think the media needs to open up that space for civil society leaders to play that role. Academics need to be uh, able, the, uh, the most ideal situation is if the academics are able to convey their message in simple languages, like we, we, what we heard just now. But as soon as we read your papers, I'm very sure the academics, are, uh, the, uh, papers that you publish, you know, will, will not be very easy for us to understand. Uh, so so th that conversion of the complexity is necessary, uh, and it needs to be a combination of people working together, not so much putting hope on the politicians alone. Many thanks. Uh, let's um, take a closer look uh, to the motives of uh, supporters of populist movements. Um, Professor Ute uh, Frevert, would you um, uh, would you say that um, there is a long tradition of populism and basically populism only changes its face from time to time? You're a historian. Um, can you maybe tell us something about cultural motives of uh, populism at, as well? And uh, what can democratic politicians to do uh, to win back the trust of uh, citizens? Well, I'm, I'm speaking as a historian, but I'm also speaking as a contemporary person who reads, the pa reads what journalists write uh, and who drives, who, who takes a cab once in a while. And my personal relations, my personal information about populism is really from cab drivers in, in Germany, in Dresden, but also in Hamburg and Berlin. And something that um, and, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm part of a generation that some people would call uh, populist, the kind of leftist populism of the 1970s when we saw all over Europe and the US new social movements springing up, you know, starting with feminism, ecology, ecological movement, uh, you name it. So kind of bottom-up um, movements that... Um, I would say distinguish themselves from what we now see by uh, not being kind of one issue movements. They were, uh, we were <laughs> in those days, um, apparently more you know, complex orientated because what I see with the right wing populism now and it's the same in, or kind of similar in the US, it's, very similar in, in the Netherlands, in uh, uh, France, in Austria, in Germany, in uh, Hungary, I'll stick to, let's stick to Europe now, is the one issue of us, the people, against them, the foreigners. It's, of course, it's the us, the people against the elite and the experts, we should add with uh, what, what Jan has said this morning. It's not just the, the, the politicians or the, the kind of academic and political elite that is the enemy. It's also all the experts who come and talk down on us. We know better. We have the wisdom of the crowd. But second, it's, it's us against them. It's our people that does not want to be diluted or changed or uh, marginalized by the influx of foreigners who come as immigrants, who come as uh, refugees, and who change the game so that we, the populists, don't feel at home anymore. And that's the kind of 
the, the, uh, the, the baseline of all the arguments that are then waged against and all the, the criticism that is then waged against the political establishment that they play down the influx of, of uh, um, 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 immigrants that they uh, don't tell us the, the truth about uh, the criminal records that they uh, charm and, and pamper the immigrants by giving them all kinds of you know, goodies that we, the people, don't get. And that's, of course, that's absolute nonsense. And you can prove that, and you have to prove that. And that's the, the uh, uh, I, I agree, there was a time when the traditional parties, as um, um, Bernard Patzel just mentioned, were at pains in finding their way to treat that. But they, and some say, well, let's not talk. They just, you know, uh, trash white trash, so to speak. Others say, well, no, let's talk, maybe not to the politicians, not to these uh, political entrepreneurs, but let's go and let's talk to the people. And that's actually been done pretty well, I would say, because the people who, who uh, flock to these populist movements, they are pretty volatile. We should not think of them, and Patzel knows much more about that than, than I do, but we should not think of them as, as a kind of fixed block that now found their home in these right-wing populist parties, but they observe very well what's been done on the in the political arena, and they change their, their voting habits, they change their opinions. Nine to 10 percent uh, uh, votes in, in our upcoming election will not, I disagree, will not change the rules of the game and will not change or kind of, you know, uh, revolutionize the German political system. If it had been 24 or 27% as in state elections in, uh, in last year, that would have been a difference. But the peak and the peak of populism in Germany, as well as in Austria and, and other countries, maybe not in France, but with a very different uh, immigration situation, the peak is over. And they kind of, um, there will be a party and there will, the party leadership will kind of dissolve uh, themselves. I mean, that's the best, the best news that we can give. As much with Donald Trump, they kind of dis discredit themselves and very openly and very publicly. And it's, it's there to be seen for, for every, every voter and every even member of, of those populist movements. So I'm not really, well, as to Europe, I'm not really concerned. I'm not really, um, 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 I, I don't feel that we, we really have to fear that populism, which does not mean that we don't have to talk with them, talk about them, talk uh, and listen. And I agree with, with Nicole that listening to these concerns and addressing them openly, but also critically and giving the figures, giving the facts and, and arguing it's not enough to feel that I'm threatened by the influx of, um, of immigrants, but I have to prove that I really get less because they come in or they've been pampered and I'm not. And that's just nonsense, that's bullshit, and we have to tell them, everybody, and not just journalists and not just politicians, but even as cab drivers, oh no, as not as drivers, but as um, people who, who uh, hop on a cab and talk to the driver. Yeah, cab driver is a, a good example. Um, if there is another tendency, it's probably that um, true um, Democrats very often use facts to convince, and true uh, populists very often use a lot of emotions. Uh, do you think that Democrats also should use more emotions for the good cause? Well, Democrats have been using emotions all the time. I mean, that's not a new invention of, the, uh, of populism. I'm, every politician who talks about, you know, you have to trust me, I trust you, is employing uh, uh, emotion talk and has been doing so uh, very, very often. It's just that, and that's what I will talk, uh, talk about at greater length tomorrow, that what populism does is that they politicize emotions. They give, it, they give emotions a political status and, a pol and, and use it as a political argument, which uh, 
well, kind of is part of our general uh, tide of elevating emotions to something, you know, authentic, tell, uh, telling uh, uh, true uh, against, you know, these kind of manipulations, uh, rational manipulations that we go through. But again, that's, that, can be, that can be tackled, that can be addressed, and that should be addressed by um, rational argument, and rational arguments can come up pretty emotionally. You know, when my cab driver tells me, I'm the people, or we are the people, meaning you are not, then I kind of retaliate very emotionally. Okay, very good. Now we have an opportunity uh, to involve uh, the audience in the discussion. We have 25 minutes more, so plenty of room for questions, quick comments. And uh, first one is my colleague Christoph Plate from Cast Media Program in Johannesburg. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and thank you for all these very interesting contributions. Professor Frever, there's a saying in good journalism, you don't quote cab drivers. Um, <laughs> I know what, not a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know exactly what you mean and I, and I think that politics and media haven't listened to the cab driver or haven't listened to the so-called um, common people. Um, additionally to, to um, what was said earlier on, I want to add that um, when it comes to the duty of the media, how to deal with populism, I think we have to face the fact um, that populism, at least in Germany, has arrived in the media. There is populist media in Germany, for example. There is populist websites. There, is, there are websites that propagate populism with um, former editors of the Spiegel News magazine and others who used to, or FAZ and others, who used to work for very respected papers. Populism and AFD has arrived in the judiciary in Germany. We have to face that and I would like to know from our colleagues from Asia, um, do you have a similar occurrence that populists arrive in the media, populists arrive in the judiciary and how does the public actually deal with that? How do politicians and the media deal with that? And my second question uh, to, to all of you basically is, um, do we have to be more concerned that we only deal with populism once an election is coming up and that in between elections, we, the media, we politicians very quickly forget the anxieties of the people? Thank you. Thank you for these questions. Let's start with uh, Nicole. Right, thank you for the question. Um, I think what's interesting in the Philippine context is we, we don't just talk about um, populist media in terms of the formal structure, but with the emergence of social media influencers, um, a lot of Filipinos now tr um, has an increasing trust with social media while trust in mainstream media is on the decline. Um, but I think what's interesting here is because there are different requirements of ethics when it comes to social media influencers because they don't follow the editorial controls of mainstream media. So now the bigger debate is how much um, credit we give to social media influencers because there is an increasing sentiment here that, you know, this, these are precisely the people that, or these are precisely the voices that aren't given platforms in mainstream media. But I think in terms of dealing with that, I think it's important I agree with the combat argument that we have to directly deal with this. But there's, I think the fear is overstated on the other hand because every time we see, for example, states using populist media to support their own objectives or powerful people using populist media to, to put forward their own objectives, there's always a, a resistance to it. There's always a counter argument to it. So all of these um, rogue accounts, for example, um, start emerging and they have their own counter publics that emerge. So. I guess just to answer the question, yes, there we have seen or we have witnessed also the rise of populist media in the Philippines, but the full picture also says there's a rise of a counter-populist media to engage with that. What we haven't perfected yet is how these two spheres can interact with each other um, to filter out what's proper information and what's information that's not particularly useful for our democracy. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the credibility of uh, traditional media versus uh, social media. Actually, we also have good examples uh, from uh, Southeast Europe, like 
There is Eurobarometer um, figures saying that uh, in countries like Bulgaria, Romania, around 35-40% of citizens believe in uh, information they receive on social media, whereas, uh, for instance, in Bulgaria we have done surveys, only 12% trust in the independence of uh, mainstream media. So uh, the trust in social media in many cases is already higher. Um, what is the case in, uh, in Malaysia? Has, have uh, media in general become more populist? And whom do people trust more, the traditional media or the social media? That, that's a very interesting question, um, whether our media has become more populist or not. Uh, <laughs> I think traditionally, and maybe even until now, our media, in Malaysia especially, uh, is not, uh, they don't even have to be populist because the media environment is controlled by the government. Um, now, uh, I cannot think of any uh, mainstream national newspapers that does not almost always side with the government. So, uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, you know, a, a media environment like that where it is so controlled, I think populism is not really a problem uh, because the parties in authority, the parties in power, can easily shape public opinion using the media platforms that they control anyway. Now, this is not just a case for Malaysia. This is a conference uh, on, on you know, things across Asia. Uh, Asia. And I think if you look at ASEAN countries, uh, at, at the very least, uh, you will see that this is a general trend. Just yesterday, a newspaper platform, an English newspaper platform in Cambodia was shut down by the government, uh, you know, because it goes against uh, what the Cambodian government believes in. Now, in that kind of environment, populism is not really a problem. It's the unfree media that is a problem. But unfortunately, with that kind of environment as well, you see you know, you know, this challenge that, that, that is uh, coming up on the, uh, on the online platforms. It's interesting you mentioned about the, the, the social media just now. I think in Malaysia, it's not just about the, the social media, it's in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. I don't really like Instagram in the sense that, you know, it's the happiest place online. Uh, there seems to be no problem on Instagram at all. Uh, people tend, tend to complain more on Facebook and, and uh, Twitter. Um, but those are not just, uh, not the only platforms. Uh, you know, we also have online news portals. And we also have portals that claim to be news portals, but they're not. They're propaganda sites. Uh, how do you distinguish between this? I have no idea. But, you know, the, the line seems to be very blurred. Now, with the rise of usage of uh, uh, applications like WhatsApp, you know, it becomes even more complex because people can just forward uh, so-called news items without even verifying it. Uh, just a few days ago, I received um, uh, a so-called article by someone prominent in Malaysia, or at least signed by uh, that someone in Malaysia. Of course, it came from somebody else. When I asked him, he said, no, I've never uh, written something like this, but it claimed to be written by him. I wonder how many thousand people have read uh, that, art that article. You know, so that, that creates a very different uh, environment altogether. It's, it's not just about populism, it's also about verifying uh, the news. I can't remember what your second uh, question is just now. But Well, the second uh, question was whether um, political parties or politicians in general pay too little attention to populism in periods outside election campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe let's give that question to Werner Patzelt and then we include more questions uh, from Thank the audience uh, and uh, Ute Frewart. Should we academics, civil society, media, politicians, deal with populism only ahead of elections? Clear answer, no. Clear answer, no. Because if my analysis is correct, that the rise of populism is always a uh, an indicator of ill-functioning of representative democracy, then we have to avoid misfunctioning defects, shortcomings of representative democracy throughout the legislative terms, throughout the presidential terms. That is, the best antidote against populism is never to let emerge the feeling that we, the people, are not long, no longer represented by our members of parliament, our presidents, uh, whomever. 
That is, we have to have a keen interest in finding out what really is worrying ordinary people, what they're really thinking about, be it imaginary or real. Because, see, one of the uh, most famous, uh, so to speak, laws of the social sciences is the Thomas theorem, saying if persons define a situation as given and act out of this definition of the situation, then the consequences of those actions are real, independent of whether the definition of the situation has been real. So since populists sometimes uh, are focused on really imaginary problems, nonsensical issues, nevertheless, their actions, voting for radical parties, doing periodic heavy and well-reported demonstrations which shape public discourse like it was the case in Germany, these are real things which are detrimental for the trust in democratic institutions and democratic processes. Therefore, dealing with the possible rise of populism is a constant challenge. Fighting radical populists is a constant challenge and it is absolutely wrong, or it would be absolutely wrong, only to focus on those very periods when under democratic circumstances politicians are simply forced to deal with what people really think, that is during electoral campaigns and ahead of election day. Again, this is the wonderful thing about democracy. At least close to election day, what ordinary people think needs to be taken into consideration. Although the political class may say, it's nonsensical, it's bullshit. Well, you have to deal with that during the electoral campaign if you want to win and not to lose. That's the wonderful thing about democracy, but there is no need to focus, to concentrate this important process of readjusting public political discourse to private political discourse among the population to deal with that only ahead of elections. This is the big mistake which the German political parties committed and as a result they have a new party which does not change the rules of the game. This was not what I claimed. They changed the strategic and tactical considerations and therefore, the moves which can be done, say, uh, during a chess game, after a certain opening, you are no longer free for the rest of the chess game. And this is the wrong opening we have made in Germany with uh, our laziness in combating the very origins of this right-wing party that we have now in the parliament. Uh, Werner Patzel just said po uh, German political parties made mistakes. Um, is your impression now that uh, this is being corrected and uh, political stakeholders take uh, care of issues of populism also between the elections? They have always done so. I'm, I'm really, I have to disagree with Werner Patzel uh, on, on this issue because I the, this, this myth, I would call it a myth of the unresponsiveness and the arrogance of politicians. Look what politicians really do. Every parliamentary representative has, it, has his or her, what they call citizens um, uh, talk or conversations once a month in their, in their local constituencies. They go back and forth. They receive emails, they re receive letters. They actually have received emails and letters for ages. And that's one thing that I would like to add to this morning's uh, panel. Communication between us and them, the politicians, did not start with online communication. Our state archives everywhere are filled with letters that citizens have written to their representatives, to the king, to the chancellor, to the president, to who, you name it. And most of these letters have been destroyed, but those that we can still read as historians in the archives tell us that since the 20th, early 20th century, maybe even earlier, poly, uh, citizens have taken, have had a voice, even beyond elections, to go up, counter uh, their, their representatives and their, their, their state officials, and tell them what actually bothers them. We should really not be too alarmistic and dramatis, dra dramatizing things now, but sometimes think back and think, life didn't start with the internet, really. Um, and this kind of online or offline communication 
between the elections is a staple in politics. Look, I mean, look what kind of rallies are being done. How many politicians are, are constantly present in these you know, numerous talk shows and really kind of not just speak down to the people, but speak with them, speak with, with other representatives, engage in debates. I would not buy this, this idea that politicians, and that's, of course, that's, that's the, the claim of, of populist movements, the elites, they are too arrogant, they don't care for us, they don't talk to us. That's not true. That's, that's, we can prove that on a daily basis, that democratic politics does not function like that. So I'm, I'm really, I, I don't buy the pessimism here. It would be boring if uh, academics always agree. Um, very quick <laughs> answer of, by Werner Patzel, and then we go to the next uh, one or two questions. I certainly agree with the statement that politicians are in constant communication exchange with uh, constituents. No doubt about that. Politicians know what people think and feel. But this does not mean that people's preferences, whatever this may be in concrete cases, are translated, are transposed, transformed into public policy because there are different concerns when it comes to shaping policy. There are coalition concerns, there are uh, party positions which cannot be ignored, although one knows that the possible voters for one's party would disagree. Therefore, very often, in spite of the fact that politicians know about people's preferences, people's preferences are not translated into public policy. And my argument is not that on all possible policy fields, the politicians would not like to transform poli uh, people's preferences into public policy, but there sometimes occur some significant policy fields. And in the case of West European populism, it was the immigration issue, it's the Europeanization issue, uh, which are really policy fields where the policy made by political leaders is not, to put it mildly, in quite close correspondence to popular preferences. Many thanks. Uh, we have a wonderful digital clock here in front of us. You cannot see it, but we see it very clearly. Uh, eight more minutes. Um, this makes for one or two more questions from the audience. Uh, please uh, mention your name, uh, where you are from, and please direct your question to one of the panelists. Thank you. My name is Mei Pin. I'm from Singapore. I'm a consultant. I want to thank KAS for assembling this wonderful panel and for your great job moderating. My question is for the last speaker. I was very intrigued by the statement you made that popul populism has peaked in Germany. I, I was just wondering w why you say that. Could you break that down for us? What did you observe to be the peak and what are your points of evidence that it is on the decline? And then are your observations that that populist movements just kind of have a natural mortality or what were the unique factors in Germany in that, that led you to say that it has peaked and is now ebbing? Okay. Thank Me, you. Means you're addressing your question to both German speakers or? To yes. The, to the last speaker. Oh, she made the statement that it has peaked. Okay. The last speaker was Professor Patzel, but... Uh, oh, no, in the, in the order of okay, the panel. Very good. Thank you. Shall we, Ute shall we, shall we collect or shall we um, No, you okay. just answer directly. Okay. It's fine. So, um, and that actually refers back to the anti-Europeanism that Werner Patzel has just addressed. The, this right-wing movement and the party that then came out of it actually started as an anti-Europeanist movement against the Euro uh, and a kind of very academic uh, party. And that, again, was, had a peak, was crumbling, and was barely kind of, well, dissolving itself. You know, split and split and split. And then September 2015 came with, the, with refugees coming to Germany uh, in great numbers, and other countries as well. And that was the hour. That was the hour when, these, when the kind of remnants of that party sensed that this could be the, the, the rallying issue. And they... They grasped it, they uh, popularized it, they took it, they monopolized it, and they saw, you know, kind of up to 24% in one of these state elections last year. Now, we are at 9% nationwide. What does that tell us? Obviously, those fears that were kind of, uh, um, 
yeah, grasped on and, and manipulated, instrumentalized by these political entrepreneurs, have kind of found their harbor. Politicians of other parties have picked up the issue, have uh, kind of atoned sometimes. <laughs> Say, well, you know, maybe too much, but we'll, we'll take care of it. And not just wir schaffen das, but also there will be policies in place. And actually, there are policies in place. The fear that people will overrun the good Germans is no longer there. And that's why we are down at 9%. And that's why I said the peak is over. Many thanks. One more question. Please, my colleague uh, Christine Wesemann uh, Kass in uh, Montevideo. And this will not be a Latin contribution. Um, thank you so much for your insight. And I just have a slight commenter because I kind of woke up in the media in the 1990s and whatever we perceive um, today from those movements like Pegida or AfD um, is something that has been there before. And if we look at the debate of the 1990s and looking at the, not only the tabloids like Bild Zeitung in Germany, but also the covers of my so beloved Der Spiegel, um, we can actually see that um, some phrases have been there. There was a lot of verbal hatred um, towards migration. Germany swallowed waves of millions of um, migrants from Eastern Europe, especially from the Soviet Union. And there was so much pessimism. But back then, everything um, was kind of swallowed by the big parties as well. So there was what was left on the, on the right um, hand or the right you know, outskirts of the politi political spectrum was just labeled nationalist or Nazi, which is not um, the case in the beginning of the AfD. As you said, it's um, an anti-European movement in, the, in its beginning. And so that populist movement had much more time to develop and it wasn't you know, so in par with the political of the bigger political parties that ruled Germany back then. And we've seen those movements, but they kind of haven't had a space, an institutionalized space to get in. And what you say was the chess game, um, Professor Patzel, that was very mind-catching for me because, you know, those parties enter and then they kind of get on everybody, everybody's nerves in the parliament or the state parliament so thus far with trying to change the rules. And then as a democratic party was like a really democratic core, you cannot really um, react. And, and most of the times, or as we see it, everyone else in, in those parliaments, the state parliaments, just unites the democratic parties. And they say just no to everything that is being raised, whatever they say. And if it would be, you know, put in some fresh air, and they just unite and say no um, to any proposition. And it, it gave me a lot of thought on, on how to deal with them. And then there's just one, maybe yes, Latin comment. Whenever we do um, political campaign training um, for our partner parties, um, one of the first questions will always be. Well, why do you engage? And oftentimes, um, and, and it, it's really independent of which country um, you're in, it would be, well, because I want that and that person to be, become president. And that's when we always start, okay, okay, um, let's maybe start again and have a whole training on, and on the thinking of why do I engage in politics and do I actually fight for a person or with a person um, who might have the capacity to you know, bring better things to life. And I think that is also a point why in Germany the populist movements aren't there for such a long time because we still have politicians who solve problems. 
and adapt to them. Okay, but that's just an, a commentary on the site. Many thanks, Christine, for this uh, comparison between uh, Germany and uh, Latin America. Um, now we have one more minute. I can just close this session, but I think it's more attractive to ask one last question to everybody, but with a one sentence, very brief answer. Um, name one concrete measure that you consider the most important to keep populism in certain limits. Let's start with Nicole. I would say citizen participation. We always tend to underestimate the rationalities of ordinary citizens, but decades of research suggest that citizens are capable to reason. We just need to give the proper space for reason giving to take root. Many thanks. Werner Fatzelt. Don't leave political space to populists. Don't leave topics to populists. Try to conquer all political and discursive territory yourself. Okay, one. But building up on that, I agree completely. We need more, more public education, and that needs to be done in a more strategic and more uh, coherent ways by all the parties. Many thanks. Ute Frivat. More offline than online communication, direct communication between us and them. Uh, thanks to you all for your high interest, for your questions, comments, and special thanks to our panelists, Nicole Curato, Ute Frewart, Werner Patzelt, Wai Saiful, Wan Jan. <laughs>